I hope you feel well rested, because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolt's. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinter's records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. And maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus, also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth, 140 pounds. So your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around 7 feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? Then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you're facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, 
You'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there, wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. But because of the conditions on the planet, and your bulky, bulky spacesuit, you'd run a bit more slowly there, at a speed of about 4 miles per hour. Before leaving, you admire Saturn's most famous feature, awesome gray, beige, and tan rings. These groups of tiny ringlets are made of chunks of rock and ice. You also spot several of the 53 moons of Saturn. Oh, that's Titan an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. The next planet on your way is a blue-green ball of ice and gas. That's ice giant Uranus. It has this beautiful hue because the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Uranus isn't solid. Hit the brakes! If your spacecraft doesn't manage to stop in time, It'll fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the icy liquid center of the planet. Hmm, I doubt you'll be able to conduct your running experiment here. So, let's just imagine what it'd look like. On Uranus, your weight would be around 138 pounds. And, against all odds, you could actually reach a good speed here, at least 8 miles per hour. If you didn't get caught in a hurricane, of course. Extreme storms occur on the planet in the summer, when Uranus is heated the most. Then, hurricanes can spread for more than 6,000 miles. The furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune, is four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The blue surface you see when approaching Neptune is actually a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. The planet's mantle is made up of water, ammonia, and methane ices. It's the closest thing Neptune has to a surface. And still, there isn't solid ground for you to walk on. So, once again, try to use your imagination. On Neptune, you'd weigh a bit more than you do on Earth, 174 pounds. But your running speed would be just a bit lower than on Earth, around 5 miles per hour. That's the end of your active adventure! Which planet did you like running on the most? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hey, I want to show you something. Let's take a little trip off of Earth and park our spacecraft somewhere near the moon. We're now almost 240,000 miles away from our home planet. That's almost 100 times the width of the United States. Now we've brought a special set of tools with us a giant hammer, and an enormous chisel. Place the chisel at the Earth's north pole and strike its head with the hammer. The Earth cracks open like an eggshell and we see another planet. This is Theia, and it's hiding inside our planet like a yolk in an egg. If you want to find out how it got there, you need to travel back in time 4.5 billion years. This beautiful nebula is what will eventually become our solar system. Color dust and various space debris are slowly coming closer toward the common center. Over time, this jigsaw puzzle of debris becomes denser and heavier. The temperature inside the giant is rising. Soon, it gets so high that it'll trigger a nuclear chain reaction. One more second, and bam! There's an explosion so powerful that the shockwaves travel far into deep space. 
When the dust clears a little, you can see that a bright light is still shining at the very center of the explosion. This newborn star is the Sun. It weighs as much as 333,000 Earths. If the Sun was a bucket, you'd need 1.3 million Earth-sized planets to fill it. But we're interested in that small object over there, 93 million miles away from the Sun. This pile of rocks and hot lava is Earth. Right now, the planet is busy forming its core while the oceans of lava are gradually cooling down. But some millions of years later, after the Sun's birth, you notice another small object. Here comes Theia. This small planet was formed at about the same time as Earth, and right now, it's following a crazy spiral trajectory at enormous speed. Scientists believe Theia was like a ball Jupiter and Venus played around with. Venus would pull Theia in one direction, and then Jupiter would pull it right back. But what makes up 99.8% of the mass of the solar system is the Sun. It's what makes Theia move into almost the same orbit as Earth. So they inevitably come closer and closer to each other until they become next door neighbors. We see that Theia is roughly the size of Mars, as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Portugal. At this point, the collision can't be avoided. Theia is traveling towards Earth at nearly 9,000 miles per hour. That's 11 times faster than the speed of sound. If this smaller planet would crash into Earth at a particular angle, Earth would most likely be torn apart, as well as Theia itself. The collision would cause a huge blast visible on other planets, even on a bright day. Nothing would be left but some burning dust and debris. Even if Theia only slightly grazes the Earth, it'll still knock out a sizable chunk. But the collision with Theia happens at a perfect 45 degree angle. It strikes the Earth at tremendous speed. The explosion literally vaporizes huge amounts of rock, and the shock wave sends the remaining debris into Earth's orbit. A huge crater is formed at the impact site, which soon gets filled in with boiling lava. The remnants of Theia and the ejected fragments of Earth begin to orbit our planet. According to one theory, these fragments actually form two moons. At first, they travel together, but one day they get too close to each other and collide, forming one large space body. The other theory claims that all the loose shards get pulled in by the remnants of Theia, and that sometime after that, they form the moon as we know it today. At this point in the past, though, it's just red-hot rock and lava. The collision at this angle slightly tilts our planet and accelerates its rotation. It's because of Theia that we have different seasons and 24 hours in a day. Now, Earth also has these things called lithospheric plates. These are enormous solid land masses that make up the crust of our planet. After the collision with Theia, they start to break and crack. It causes carbon, a primary component of all known life on Earth, to start moving all over our planet. So Earth gains a kind of uh, metabolism. After a few hundred million years, the first living creatures start to appear on our planet. Over the next nearly four billion years, simple single-cell organisms evolve into the kinds of complex life you see today. According to scientists, a collision like we had with Theia is a very rare event. The probability that somewhere out there there's a planet like ours that has survived the same catastrophe is even rarer still. This may be the reason why we have yet to find other traces of other civilizations out there in space. Meanwhile, the remains of Theia are still here on Earth. Of course, it doesn't look like an actual entire planet stuck inside our own. Most of the fragments have melted and blended into the Earth's crust. If you take the top layer off our planet, you'll see two huge lava blobs the size of large continents. They're right below Africa and the Pacific Ocean. Presumably, these are the remains of Theia. They didn't mix with the Earth's mantle because of different densities. It's like mixing water and oil in a glass. The oil will always float up over the water and create an even layer on top of it. But if you raise these lava patches up to the surface, they'd be a hundred times higher than Mount Everest. Other remains of Theia might be on the moon. The Apollo space missions brought back many soil samples for analysis, which led scientists to conclude that the moon is very similar to the Earth in structure. Someday in the future, people could drill deep down and take samples of the moon's crust. Then they'd analyze the blobs from Earth, and if their structure matched, it would be undeniable proof that Theia did hit Earth 4.5 billion years ago and gave us the moon. But for the time being, Theia remains an unsolved mystery. 
scientists are still not sure that the planet actually existed. The whole idea does perfectly fit the model of the moon's creation, but it's also possible that this incredible collision may have never happened. Now, let's travel 41 light years away from Earth to the planet 55 Cancri E. It's about twice the size of Earth and eight times heavier. Let's take out our giant hammer again and use it to hit the chisel. The planet cracks and you see it's a giant diamond. The temperature on this planet is tens of times higher than on Earth and its soil is rich in carbon. The heat puts a lot of pressure on this carbon and the structure changes. First, it turns into graphite, but then add just a bit more pressure and the graphite turns to diamond. On Earth, diamonds form at depths 60 miles below sea level, where the pressure is 50,000 times greater than that on the surface. And the temperature there averages over 1,000 degrees, which is as hot as fire. Diamonds are often ejected closer to the surface in volcanic eruptions, but still, people mostly have to dig mines 1,500 feet deep to find these beautiful gems. Currently, the Golden Jubilee Diamond is the biggest cut and faceted diamond on Earth. It weighs as much as a chocolate bar and is the size of a hamster. Its price is about $12 million. Now, imagine a diamond the size of an entire planet! Now, let's fly back to our solar system. Our destination now is Jupiter's moon, Europa. It's as wide as the distance between Seattle and Houston. And its mass is less than 1% of the mass of Earth. Its surface is enclosed in an icy crust that's about 19 miles thick. Europa is completely covered in water. It's freezing here, three times colder than that of the North Pole and Earth. The water turns to ice almost instantly. But the ocean beneath the surface is still liquid. Europa has a gravitational relationship with Jupiter, just like the Moon with the Earth. This creates tidal forces that heat Europa's core, which then melts the ice around it. The result is a huge ocean, two or three times larger than that of Earth's oceans combined. Scientists believe that water is one of the essential ingredients for life. This means that life may exist on Europa. There could be thermal springs, just like at the bottom of our oceans, though the water there is probably much warmer. And even though the pressure and temperature in such places are likely to be extreme, simple bacteria could live there. Europa is almost the same age as Earth, so there has been enough time for living organisms to appear and evolve. Who knows, maybe some advanced civilization is already blooming under this crust of ice. They might be building big cities and dreaming of conquering space. But for now, all we can do is speculate and maybe someday send a probe to Europa to find out if life is possible there. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Have we found another civilization? Is that a door to someone's home on another planet? Can we peek through the windows? After all, it was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. And right now, this rover is exploring the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, astronomers were fast to disappoint us. They claim that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There are several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, it's tiny, a mere 3 feet high. But it might simply mean the Martians aren't that tall, you may object. But scientists keep insisting that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. The thing is, if you look at the rock attentively, you may notice strata, the layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And now you can see that they disappear inside the door. And look at this! See those cracks? Yeah, those! That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight, and this created the door-shaped opening. Now, This theory is quite plausible. 
Because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago, and Martian winds haven't got rid of it yet. And winds on Mars can be exceptionally powerful. This planet is infamous for its intense dust storms. Sometimes they kick up so much dust that you can see it through a telescope on Earth. Such storms occur every year and cover continent-sized areas. They also last for weeks at a time. But besides these annual storms, there are even larger storms that happen much more rarely. But they're more powerful and way more intense. Those are called global dust storms because they encircle the entire planet. But even if you got caught in the most severe storm on Mars, it wouldn't be as terrible as you might think. The wind speed on the worst Martian storms reaches 60 miles an hour tops. Hurricane force winds on our planet can be twice that speed. You should also keep in mind that the atmosphere on the red planet is 1% as dense as the atmosphere on Earth. That's why, if you decided to fly a kite on Mars, you'd need the wind to be much faster than on Earth. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to get the kite in the air. In other words, even though it's quite windy on Mars, it doesn't feel as intense as on our home planet. Oh, by the way, you might have noticed I keep calling Mars the red planet. Why? Look, our neighbor is covered in dust, soil, and rock that is rich in iron oxide. That's what gives the surface of the planet its trademark red hue. And look, there's the trademark! Nah, just kidding. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. Not so far away from the star, you might say. And still, it's a cold and deserted world. The average temperature on its surface is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you ever visit one of its poles during the wintertime, bring a lot of warm clothing. Because the temperatures are likely to drop to minus 220 degrees there. In the summer, though, you might feel very comfortable in some regions. There, the temperatures can rise to 70 degrees, not very different from what we're used to. Mars is one of the most explored space bodies in the solar system. At the moment, NASA has two rovers roaming the red landscapes, Curiosity and Perseverance. There's also one lander called InSight and Helicopter Ingenuity, nicknamed Ginny. Perseverance is the most advanced and largest rover ever sent to another world. The journey to the red planet took 203 days, and Ginny traveled to Mars attached to the belly of Perseverance. Sounds cozy. And now, I'm going to tell you something really curious. Let's say you're a Babylonian who lived around 5,000 years ago. Babylonia was an empire in ancient Mesopotamia. Just think back to 6th grade. Anyway, your neighbor comes up to you and says, what day is it today? And what do you answer? It's Mars Day! Wait, what? When the ancient Babylonians created the week, they decided to divide it into seven parts. Each day got named after some space body, like the Moon, the Sun, Venus, and so on. Mars Day was on Tuesday. The Babylonians believed that each of these space objects influenced their lives on the day named after it. And since Mars was red in color, they associated it with aggression. That's why on Tuesdays, they had special ceremonies to avoid the influence of the unfriendly planet. Indeed, Mars might seem unfriendly to a tired traveler. Its atmosphere is very thin. Its volume is a near 1% of the atmosphere on Earth. In other words, there's 99% less air to breathe on the red planet. Mars's atmosphere is mostly made up of carbon dioxide. At such high concentrations, it's toxic for us humans. And if you were looking for some oxygen to breathe on Mars, you'd come away empty-handed. There's only one-tenth of one percent of oxygen in the air on the red planet. That's definitely not enough for you to survive there. At the moment, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Astronomers think they may be asteroids once caught in the gravitational field of the planet. The moons are shaped like potatoes. That's because their mass is too little for gravity to give them a spherical form. Potatoes, eh? Maybe they should be renamed Mashed and O'Groton. One day, Mars will get a ring of its own. It might happen in the next 20 to 40 million years. Will Brightside be there? Stay tuned. Mars's gravitational forces will tear apart the planet's largest moon, Phobos. Hey, it really will get mashed. Some chunks of the former moon will crash into Mars, and others will break apart and create the ring around the planet. This ring might exist for at least 100 million years.
The surface of Mars is cut by a huge canyon system known as Vals Marineris. Mm, sounds like a pasta sauce. If it were on Earth, it'd stretch all the way from New York to California, over 3,000 miles. At its widest part, the largest canyon on Mars is 200 miles, and it reaches 4 miles at its deepest point. If you still have difficulties imagining the sheer size of this natural phenomenon, here you go. Vals Marineris is 10 times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth. Now, since we're on the subject of gigantic things, let's talk about Olympus Mons. This is the largest volcano in the solar system, and it's on Mars too. It's three times as tall as Mount Everest on our planet. And that's the tallest mountain above sea level. And the base of Olympus Mons is as large as the state of New Mexico. Now, scientists think there could have been water on Mars in the past. What made them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that could only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet, but Mars' atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface. Now, it only exists in the form of water ice. You can find it just under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides, and there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere, but it only exists as vapor. So, as a vacation spot, I think I'll pass. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.